Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about all the books that I read in January. In January, I read 10 books, and most of them were absolutely fantastic. So I thought I would take some time to go through them all. I haven't done any monthly wrap-ups or anything like that on this channel before, but I thought that this would be a good idea to start in 2022 for two main reasons. The first is that it takes some pressure off of me doing a full review of the books. Ever since starting this YouTube channel, I now feel guilty if I read a book and don't do a full review of it, which isn't really good. Um, and a lot of times I read a book and I don't have very strong feelings about the book. And I tend to only review books that I absolutely love. So if I read a book and I just thought it was okay, and I didn't have strong feelings about it, or I don't think that I have a unique angle or a unique lens through which to view this book, then I usually won't talk about it. Or if someone else has already done a better review of it on YouTube, I usually don't bother. The other reason that I thought this might be a good idea is because in my reviews, I usually don't talk that much about my experience reading a book. I don't really talk about whether I liked the book or not. Usually I take, I take for granted that I did like the book and that there's something in this book that is worth talking about. There's something that's worth extracting. So in my reviews, I tend to to only kind of mention at the beginning or end of the review whether or not I actually even enjoyed the book. I focus there more on extracting something from the book and leaving my, at least trying to, leaving most of my subjective experience out of it. Whereas here, my experience will be, my experience and my uh, opinion on the book will be centered rather than some sort of literary analysis. Anyways, I'll try to be as brief as possible going through these books and a few of them I've already done reviews on and some of them I'm currently working on reviews of. Um, so um, in those books, I'll be briefer than the ones that I'm probably not going to do a review of anytime soon. And I'll go through them in the order in which I read them for some reason. The first book I read this month was Jenny Falls, Girls Against God. This book was quite interesting. Uh, Jenny Fall, if you don't know, is a Norwegian uh, artist. She's a Norwegian singer, primarily. Um, and I haven't listened to a ton of her music, but since reading this book, I've listened to more of it, and I quite like it. And this book is really interesting for, for a lot of reasons. It's very much in that counterculture, kind of radical feminist tradition in which, I mean, let, let me just read the first sentence. I hate God. It feels primitive and pitiful to say it, but I am a primitive and pitiful person. <laughs> so there is this kind of punk counterculture aesthetic going throughout this entire book where our main character is living in Norway and she just goes against all mainstream ideas, all mainstream culture, all mainstream ideologies. And this book is very angry. She, she talks so much about how much she loves to hate and she kind of just hates on mainstream cultures. So this book is really interested in, in feminism, in counterculture, in that sort of punk aesthetic and draws into these discussions this interest in horror and in cults and the occult. There's a lot of stuff here on witchcraft um, and stuff like that. And she, she kind of draws uh, the connection between witchcraft and feminism. So yeah, pretty interesting book, um, especially if you're into feminist theory. There's a lot of feminist theory going on here that's really admirable. Um, not It's not fully my aesthetic. Um, this kind of angry, angsty, you know, anti-theist, anti-mainstream culture um, is something I think I would have appreciated back in my early 20s, maybe late teens. Um, and that's not to say that this is like a, a juvenile book by any means. Um, I think it's I think it's great. It's just not fully my thing. Next up was America and the Cult of the Cactus Boots, a diagnostic by Philip Friedenberg with visuals by Jeff Walton. Um, I don't know what else to say about this book. I made a full review on this. Um, absolutely loved this book. This book is invigorating. Few books have made me want to write, want to create something more than this book. It's inspiring. It's fun. It's funny. Just an amazing book if you can get your hands on it. I really think it paves a way for what literature can do. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to say about this book um, other than I absolutely loved it and it's absolutely probably going to make my end of the year um, best books of the year. The next book I read was The Wolf in the Whale by Jordana Max Brodsky. 
this this month I was interested in reading more fantasy and reading kind of more for for leisure. I read a lot of big books right at the end of last year, so I needed a bit of a break. Um, and this book is isn't really fantasy; it's kind of sold as fantasy. Um, it's more historical fiction. I mean, I kind of picked it up on a whim because again, I, I wanted something a bit lighter, and I also wanted something. Um, very wintry, and this book is very, very wintry. It focuses on Inuit cultures in uh, North America, kind of around the year 1000 CE, and it does some pretty interesting stuff with these Inuit cultures and with their mythologies, their ideologies, their worldviews, um, and it particularly does really cool things with gender. Uh, I'll spoil the first three full chapters, which is the first 40 pages. So if you don't want that spoiled, um, just skip ahead until this is off the screen. Um, but this, the main character's name is Omat, and he is born and assigned male at birth. But come to find out, he, you know, he's raised as a male, he's raised as a, as a boy. Um, and, you know, in the first four chapters, we, we realize that he has female genitalia. Um, but everyone in his group treats him as if he is a, a, a boy, though some of them know that he has female genitalia. So th this idea that this, this book is very interested in like gender performativity and the fluidity of gender. Um, and it does some pretty interesting things with that. But then the other thing that this, this book does that I really liked and what kind of drew me to this book was it plays with the uh, attempted colonization of North America by... Icelanders and Greenlanders around the year 1000. Um, the, the story is told in the Icelandic sagas, in the Vinland sagas, in Erik Saga Roida and Grænlandiga Saga, Erik the Red Saga, and the Saga of the Greenlanders. In this attempted settlement by the children of Erik the Red, um, most famously Leif the Lucky, though he isn't really in the sagas that much, um, Leif Erikson, uh, the more important colonizer or explorer is uh, Freythis Eriksdatir. Um, and she's really cool. And she is in this book and she plays a pretty prominent role. And so what this book does that is really cool is that it shows the, the interactions between this Inuit culture and the Norse culture that attempts to settle this land. And it draws these parallels and these conflicts um, between these people and between these two mythologies, the, their two religions, um, which is exceptionally cool. And if you know anything about Norse mythology, um, if you've read any of Thorimskvitha or any of the stuff that Snorri Sturluson wrote in his Edda, um, you know that Loki also has very interesting uh, perspectives or a very interesting performance of his own gender. Um, so there's a lot of interesting gender things going on and um, Brodsky draws connections between our main character and Loki in, in certain ways, um, which is quite neat. So this does some cool things with the, the attempted settlement of Vinland in so, some interesting ways. There is some weird things in here that kind of irked me, um, particularly with the depiction of the Norse culture. They have, she has a lot of the Norsemen talk to each other and call themselves by, or call each other by their patronymics. So instead of calling someone like Thorhall, they'll call that person Gunnarsson, which is very bizarre. It'd be like just calling them the son of Gunnar. You wouldn't really do that. It doesn't happen in the sagas. So that was pretty weird. But Pretty light read in a lot of ways, but I think it did some really interesting things, especially, again, with, with gender, with these two mythologies, with Inuit culture. Um, I thought it was a pretty cool book. The next book I read was Mona by Pola Oleksarek. This book I'm currently working on a review of because it, it does some really interesting things that I think I should talk about specifically because it makes fun of academics quite a bit and it makes fun of the literary elite of the world. But this book is about this young... Uh, Peruvian author, um, and Oleg Zarek, by the way, is from Argentina, I should note that. Um, this book follows Mona, who is a, a young poet, artist by, uh, uh, from Peru, and she was just nominated for what is essentially the most prestigious literary award in Europe. So she goes to this literary conference in Stockholm, where she meets with all these other writers from all around the world. And Really, what this book is about is a scathing, scathing critique of the literary elite, of, of the academic world, and especially with how they deal with, with people from places, especially in the global south. Um, she 
uh, Mona is a woman of color. And I only put that in quotations because she makes fun of that term quite a bit. Uh, Mona talks about how she didn't know that she was a woman of color until she came to the U.S. Um, and now it's the most important part of her identity. This book is about how the uh, literary elite often also tokenize and exploit people of color. How even the most liberal institutions in the West are also kind of racist in a lot of ways. Um, and so the book is very much interested in that on one side, on, on how these prizes are kind of insipid and bizarre and how American institutions are also kind of exploitative, especially to these kinds of people. And then on the other side, it's very much about uh, Mona deals with some pretty serious trauma and pretty serious abuse that happened just before this book opens. So she's processing all of this while on this trip to Stockholm to see if she wins this award. So you can really see how these two things probably go hand in hand, this abusive and exploitative, uh, these abusive and exploitative males that she's been dating, and this literary world that is also pretty exploitative. Like I said, I'm working on a full review of this book right now because um, I did have some problems with it, especially in how it depicts these other writers from all around the world. Um, I'll talk about that in, in, in the review a little bit. But overall, I thought this was a really fun read that was very, um, as someone who has spent you know, the better part of a decade in academia, um, I thought it was really funny and really um, just a biting satire of, of these institutions that we like to think as so liberal and so progressive when in a lot of ways they're just as exploitative and abusive as all of our other institutions. The next book I read was The Blue Fox by Schoen. I just put a review of this out earlier this week. Um, I love this book. I, I, I love Schoen. I love how he writes these seemingly so simple stories that always leave me wanting more, more of an expl explanation, more of a description, more, well, a longer page count. Um, but there's something to that, that that's the exact same feeling I get when I read mythology, when I read Norse mythology. You know, if you want to read Norse mythology, uh, you know, just read the, the Elder Edda and you realize that that's the only source that we have, or almost the only source, it's not really the only source. It's one of the only sources that we have of any Norse mythology. So as soon as you read it, you finish and go, wait, that's it? But then you read it again and you dig deeper. But yeah, it, it reads like mythology in a lot of ways in that, you know, you, you see into this world just a little bit, but so much of the world is left in shadow, ju 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 just in the background. Um, but I really like his stuff. I, I think it's very sparse. It's very um, stark and austere. Um, and, you know, you can see this book flies by. Most of the pages aren't, aren't filled up all the way. Um, yeah, I mean, go watch my video that I just put out if you want to hear more of my thoughts on it. Um, I think it's a great, I think it's a great little novella. Um, I think it's a really good introduction to Schoen, too, if you're interested in Icelandic literature. Um, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good starting point, because, again, it's very, very short, very, very simple, seemingly simple. Um, it's very, very deep in its simplicity. The next book I read was Vita Nostra by Marina and Sergi Jachenko. This book I read on the recommendation of Fraser Simons over at the channel Springboard Thought. And again, this kind of goes on my, 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 my trend this month of reading a bit more fantasy, of trying to get back into fantasy a little bit more. Um, this is a pretty popular fantasy series that um, I, I've heard quite a bit about. Um, a lot of people love it and a lot of people hate it. Um, I thought it was quite interesting. I thought it was actually a nice relief to a lot of fantasy <laughs> uh, in that it it does a lot of the same kind of tropes as modern fantasy books, um, but it kind of plays with them a little bit more. This book is about this young girl named Sasha um, who is recruited into this university that she knows nothing about, um, and they refuse to tell her anything about what what this university is. Um, so there's all of this interesting stuff going on with, with deception and illusion, um, but she goes to the university and it's not really what you would expect from a university in a fantasy book. And it's actually a very, very abusive university. Um, and that's actually why I like this book so much, because it took this trope of the, of the you know, dark academy, the, the, the university, and kind of flipped it on its head 
in how totalitarian and abusive it really is. It reminded me a lot of some of the stuff that Michel Foucault has written about schools in which he talks about how, you know, there's the only difference between schools and prisons is are, are the bars on the windows. Um, both of these things, schools and prisons, are, you know, efforts to, to as Foucault says, uh, he says, schools serve the same social function as prisons and mental institutions to define, classify, control, and regulate people. And that's really what this university in this book does. It attempts to classify and regulate people and control them. But I think this book is actually quite smart in a lot of ways. And I think it's engaging with a lot of literary theory, especially like structuralism and deconstructualism and semiotics. Um, I think there's some like Deridian deconstructualism going on with how this book addresses language, especially in the university. Um, I think it's doing some pretty interesting things there, but no one wants to hear about literary theory. Um, one thing I particularly like about this, this book, though, is how everyone at the university has no idea why they're there, that they're just kind of there. And that reminds me of some of my students. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in like a, a mean way, um, but a lot of my students, as did I when I was in undergrad, they don't really know why they're in college. They were just kind of told to go by their parents, and so they went. And they're trying to kind of figure out what they're doing as they're there. And this book really focuses on that and focuses on this listlessness and this, this kind of unknowingness because with that, you know, comes abusive relationships. Um, you know, if one person doesn't really know what they're doing, then the person who does know what they're doing can abuse them. Can't really say more without spoiling the ending. But if you're looking for a more full review of this book, go check out Fraser Simon's video on it. He does a great job in both a non-spoiler section and a spoiler-filled section. If you're confused at the ending or anything like that, he explains it all. Um, and yeah, after watching that video, I couldn't really say anything better than that. So I'll just direct you to that video. Um, really interesting fantasy book. Um, I would recommend it. Next up is Monument Maker by David Keenan. This is an unwieldy, sprawling book that regrettably, I don't think I'll be doing a review on it in full. Um, anytime soon. Um, I read it and I immediately think that I need to reread it. And in fact, I, I've seen people, a lot of people talk about how you do need to reread it. And in fact, you need to reread it backwards after reading it uh, forwards, which I don't think I'm going to do anytime soon. But this book is really brilliant. If you have the time to really dig into it, it's again, one of those just maximalist encyclopedic books that does a lot of interesting things with, with storytelling, and there's a lot of stories within stories within stories in this book. It's really an impossible book to summarize, but it's about this, this guy who goes to France, or he's remembering back to his time where he went to France um, and drove around with his lover, and they visited all these cathedrals in France. Um, this book is structured like a cathedral. Uh, in some really interesting ways. So it's very interested in, in cathedrals, in these monuments. Um, but he goes to all of these cathedrals, and while he's there, he's translating a book by this architect named Pierre Melville. And so we're sucked back into Pierre Melville's life as he does all of these things. And he has a friend named uh, Max Rayberg, who spent the time in Africa. So then we're sucked into his life and we start following him around in Africa, et cetera. It's impossible to summarize. I'm not gonna really try it here. Um, there are set pieces in here. There are some stories in here that are absolutely brilliant. There's a story about the siege of Khartoum in 1884 that is absolutely brilliant. And there's another scene that takes place in a prisoner of war uh, prison. In, uh, in, in, in Germany during World War II, in which all these prisoners tell each other stories. Um, and one prisoner specifically tells very long stories. And so this book is very digressive. And it reads much, I mean, it's structured like a cathedral and it reads very much like you're wandering through a cathedral and you look up and you see, you know, a, a statue on, on, on the wall and you learn about the whole story of that statue. And then you take three more steps and you see a painting and you learn about that, uh, you know, that, that painting and the whole story that that painting depicts. And so this book is very polyphonic in a lot of ways as we get all of these different points of views and we're never quite sure who is talking. 
um, or where the story is going. Um, but it does come together in the end. And that's why I think I do need to reread it because now that I've read it and I see where it, it goes, where it where it's gone, now I think I could reread it and get a lot more out of it. It's really interested in puzzles, in hidden histories, in occult history, in cults, um, and stuff like that. So if you're interested in very sprawling, maximalist books, um, I think you'd really, really enjoy this one. It's just not a book that I have all the time and attention to give it right now, um, though I do want to reread it soon um, and, and formulate my, my thoughts more clearly on it, uh, because I do think that it is a very good and very, very smart book that I'm looking forward to rereading. The next book on the list is Hannah Erstevik's The Pastor, which came out at the end of 2021, um, though it was originally published in Norwegian in 2004, I believe. Um, and I read Erstevik's other translated book, called Love. It's actually one of the first books that I reviewed on this channel. Don't go watch that review. Um, but this book is is great. Um, I love Hannah Erstevik. She has such a, a precise prose style that I, I really, really like. This book is about a woman in her 30s who, after a tragedy occurred to her and someone close to her um, when she was living in, in Germany, she moves to the far north of Norway to take up a role as an adjunct pastor in this very small town. And so she's a pastor at this town, but she's also a doctoral student. And she's doing research on this Sami rebellion that took place 150 years ago in this town in Norway that she is now a pastor in. And so there is this, this history of abuse and trauma, both personally for her that she's processing and that a lot of the people in town are processing. But there's also this much larger cultural uh, abuse and trauma of, of colonization, of the relationship between Norwegian people in this far north area and the Sami native people that were essentially kicked out of their land. And so this book really focuses in on Liv, our main character, the, the pastor, um, but it keeps getting sucked back into, into the past as she learns more and more about what happened during this rebellion. In this rebellion, um, Sami people uh, kind of invaded the town and killed a bunch of the townspeople. As these two groups kind of kept fighting and fighting. Um, and one thing that's particularly interesting though is because, because she is both a pastor and a doctoral student, she's very interested in, in language and how language uh, bears with it authority and and the truth essentially right or at least it should uh, hold the truth within it and so she while she's doing research on this rebellion she's also doing research in the bible of course right she's always reading the bible and interpreting it just as she's interpreting this history and when she finds how language has enforced or created a lot of these problems right the 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 fighting between the Norwegians and the Sami people has to do a lot with these antagonistic religions, these antagonistic worldviews, these antagonistic languages. And her job as a pastor is in many ways to spread the word of God, which has led to a lot of colonization um, in a lot of areas in the world. And so she's confronted with this issue, with this paradox that's you know, very much a personal thing for her as she is very religious, of course, she's a pastor, but it's also very important more largely, right? More, more culturally. This book is really about the intersection between those things, about the intersections between religion, language, and colonialism. The next book that I read is Mikhail Shishkin's Maiden Hair, which was published, I think, in the early 2010s. Yeah, uh, it was published originally in Russian in 2005 and translated originally in 2012. This book is absolutely incredible. If there are two highlights from this month, it would definitely be America in the Cult of the Cactus Boots and Maidenhair. Maidenhair is astonishingly brilliant. I'll definitely be making a full video on Maidenhair, though I need to do a bit of research first, um, and I need to really kind of think about this book more because it is an incredibly difficult book in a lot of ways. Um, it's polyphonic in that we're always jumping between these different these different viewpoints and these different forms. Actually, we start this book in a 
in a Q&A format as we quickly learn that what we're actually dealing with, right, where there's a series of questions and answers, but we learn that what we're dealing with is asylum seekers seeking asylum in Switzerland. And the questions are coming from this man named Peter, who is the interrogator. And uh, the answers are coming from people trying to seek asylum, refugees from various regions around the world. And our main character throughout this book is the interpreter of these uh, asylum seekers, right? He, he is, he's the guy who is interpreting both of these questions and these answers. And so we get that. And then occasionally we'll just get thrown into the interpreter's personal life and we'll get sections from that perspective. And then he's also translating a journal from this pretty famous uh, singer, this Russian singer. He's translating her diaries and most of her diary entries are from the years like 1915 or so to like 1930. So through her, we see, you know, World War I, the Russian Revolution, and all of this different stuff. And then on top of all of that, we get these glimpses of biblical and like mythic history as the past keeps bleeding into the present where we'll be dealing with the interpreter and then all of a sudden we'll get this small passage that has to do with like biblical history or ancient history. It reminded me a lot of Matthias Zanar's Zone in which this these ancient histories just kind of seep into the present and we just catch a glimpse of it and then it fades away. But this book is just, I mean, in terms of the ideas that it explores, they're about as grand as you can possibly get, right? It's, it's exploring everything from war, God, storytelling, interpretation, how, how, we, how we derive truth from other people's stories. This book is always about interpretation. How do we read other people's stories? How do we know what to believe? How do we separate fact from fiction? Can we ever do that? This book is absolutely remarkable. Um, it is it is so brilliant in so many ways, and it's so it's a very dense read, um, and it's a very difficult read because again, similar to Monument Maker in how polyphonic it is, you're often not sh quite sure who's speaking to you um, as it moves between these forms and it jumps back and forth with really no um, you know other than just like a paragraph break, nothing really to to tell you what point of view you're, you're looking from. Um, incredible, incredible book. I'll definitely be doing a full review of this one. Um, that one, I, I can guarantee. Uh, great book. And the last book that I read in January was Drifts by Kate Zambrino. This book is sort of set up as a diary in that it's very fragmentary as we move through all of these various thoughts that uh, Zambrino has while she's kind of writing this book. as It's very meta in a lot of ways as she's writing this book as we're reading it. And I would say this book falls right into that category of autofiction. Um, she, she actually makes fun of that term a little bit, kind of indirectly, by making fun of Karlova Knausgar um, as if he invented this term. Um, and she talks about how her and all of these other authors like her, mainly women, um, have been doing this f forever. Um, but only since Karlova Knausgar has done it with his uh, My Struggle series has it become more mainstream. But this book is chock full of really, uh, really insightful uh, literary criticism and, his and stuff on the history of photography. And she reads um, all of these photographs and she reads all of these, all of these books and these letters. Um, she's working on a, a book that focuses on Rilke. So there's all this stuff on Rilke in here. There's all this stuff on the, the uh, engravings of Albrecht Durer on Peter Hujar. I think you can really see the influence of Susan Sontag on Kate Zambrino in this book. Um, there, there's stuff on, on, on Sebald. Um, I read way too many books that are very difficult to summarize because there's really no plot here, just like in a lot of the books that I really like, um, which is why I really enjoyed this book um, because it doesn't center a, a, a plot-based narrative. It, it just focuses on this narrator who is drifting through life, um, living in New York while trying to make ends meet. Um, and she's a writer and she's a professor as well. And she's just living kind of a, a solitary life where she's just trying to figure out, you know, how, how to get by. 
And this book also focuses quite a bit on her on her pregnancy. Um, she, she gets pregnant and she needs to kind of deal with that, especially dealing with the repercussions of being pregnant while being an artist, being a teacher. But yeah, it's kind of my one of my favorite kinds of books, bu books that just kind of float between ideas. Um, it reminded me a lot of, of Knausgar. Lynn Ullman has books like this. Um, these books that just kind of move between, between ideas rather than move between plot points. Um, really, really enjoyed this. I might be doing a full review on that because I took way too many notes when I was reading that book because I thought it was really insightful. Again, a lot of her discussions of, of Rilke and of all these different artists um, are, are really, I mean, this book could be a book of literary criticism at times, um, but I really, really enjoyed enjoyed this book. So let me know what you think of this format. Um, if you like this more informal style or not, um, I'm happy to do this every month, though I might not do it every month. I might end up doing it, you know, once every, every two months or once every quarter or something like that. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Let me know what you think um, for now. Thanks for watching.